day in Manhattan Clear as could be Till the planes hit the buildings And changed history They stood for an hour Once the damage was done But then suddenly crumbled Seconds they were gone There were cascading projections of steel into dust it Looked like explosions but it was not discussed So I turn off the TV And shut out the lights It's all just illusion Right in front of my eyes Well, I'm not scared of dying We're all bound from heaven Just sharing the truth About 9-11 Now building number seven Drop the cleanest of all Yet the world still knows nothing Of this amazing free fall There was no real reason It wasn't hit by a plane They say it was a fire Yet you can't see the flames You see cascading projections of steel into dust like demolition but it's never discussed so I turn off the TV and shut out the lights it's all just illusion right in front of my eyes well I'm not scared of dying we're all back Sharing the truth About 9-11 They say that the bigger the lie The more people believe And the deeper the fear The more easily we are deceived and Turn off the TV And I shut out Hey, well, welcome to another episode of 9-11 was an inside job and other state crimes against democracy. Uh, we've had a lot of things going on, like the shutdown of government and the subsequent reopening of the same. And uh, in the meantime, you know, it's scam after scam to scare us and frighten us. And they're still blaming guns for the uh, people on psychotropic drugs going around killing people. Don't look at the drug history. Just take away the guns, that'll fix it, right? There's no other way to kill people. Well, anyway, we're going to start off today's show with a uh, um, an InfoWars clip about uh, the TSA. If you recall, a few months back I played a clip about a guy who uh, uh, showed you how to carry metal objects through the, the TSA scanners at the airport and showed how they were bunk. They didn't really stop anything from knowledgeable people and uh, that was quite a scandal and you know we kind of got lost in the memory hole but 
the, the guys coming back, and it turns out that the TSA's own statistics show that it's uh, you know more of a circus. So we're going to go ahead and play this clip, and uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. Well, our guest tonight is John Corbett. Now, you may remember him as the privacy activist who did a video showing just how easy it was to thwart the TSA's scanners. He has a website, tsaoutofourpants.com. Now, John has also filed several lawsuits, and the current lawsuit that he has is on his blog post I just gave you the address for, but it is heavily redacted by the TSA. Now, one of our writers, Don Salazar, was able to find the lawsuit on pacer.gov where, interestingly enough, the redacted portions of the TSA took out are very visible there. We can see exactly what they were concerned about. We can see exactly what they didn't want you to know. Amazing revelations from John Corbett. Welcome, John. Thank you. Good to be here. Thank you for doing what you're doing. Now, these are really amazing revelations. And Before we talk about them, let's talk about how you got to them as part of this lawsuit. You were able to get at documents that they had marked for official use only. Is that correct? Correct. So uh, a challenge to, to most TSA procedures uh, gets filed in the Court of Appeals and uh, it becomes a review of, of the TSA's basis for their decision. So they, they, they provide that basis in the form of a whole bunch of documents they call an administrative record. And uh, in this case, the, the record was comprised of both public and, uh, and, and private uh, and in some instances, actual classified documents, um, and uh, therefore necessitated me filing uh, two briefs, a public one and, and a, a private uh, redacted one for the court. Now, as part of these documents that you got, you mentioned in your lawsuit what they did not redact was that these four official use only documents, there's two threat assessments that are two years and five years old. And, uh, but you were, and you say that they don't really contain any information that poses a threat to the uh, uh, law enforcement or anything that uh, uh, they should not release under Freedom of Information Act. Tell us what you found when you looked at these documents that they want to keep secret. Correct. So those, those documents are labeled for official use only, which is, is, is an administrative classification, which means the TSA can just kind of mark it that way as, at will and mm -hmm. uh, basically try and hide from Freedom of Information Act requests and, and things like that just by marking documents this way. Um, there's very little oversight, very little review, um, but uh, in this case, the court did order um, that they turn over the documents uh, from my review. Uh, in, in the lawsuit. Uh, and, and it's, and it's kind of interesting to look at this because when we look at the redacted versus the non-redacted, you're reading through this and it says, it's in the public interest to release these documents because they contain the bombshell revelation that the TSA has, and it stops. They redact that. But then what we find on pacer.gov is that the TSA has literally zero evidence that anyone is plotting to blow up an airplane leaving from a domestic airport. Correct. That is, that is the conclusion that the TSA came to in their 2011 assessment. So they know that there's no risk to us and they're proceeding on with this absurd security theater that we all have to be put through at the airports anyway. Now, we all knew that it was a fraud. I mean, even back in 2011, now, these threat assessments went back to 2011. In 2011, that was a time that Representative John Micah out of Florida, who was the guy who created the TSA, he called it at that time, his little bastard child. And at that time, he was talking about how he had looked at their failure rates, which they don't want anybody to know. And he said it was totally unacceptable, totally useless, in other words. He had already told us that their, their uh, methods of screening were useless. So if they've got absolutely useless security at the airports, that would tell you, that since we haven't had an attack right there, that there's not any threat. But the TSA knows that. The TSA has known that for a couple of years and have said that internally in documents, but they could continue to go through this theater. Correct. Um, the, the numbers, as, as, um, as, the, the, as Micah has, has said, were, were abysmal. Uh, we, we got a little bit of evidence about that uh, last year when I interviewed a TSA screener who uh, flat out said the body scanner would miss things all the time, big, small, metallic, non-metallic, uh, things like guns and knives. Um, you, you'd think that um, something so so big and obvious as, as a handgun 
uh, would be an easy catch, but uh, unfortunately it's not. Um, the, the TSA is, is unable to do this. The new technologies are less able to catch these things because a, a metal detector has a pretty good chance of catching a gun. Uh, a body scanner, on the other hand, does not. Tell us about that video where you were able to sneak something through. Sure. So I, I produced a video back a year and a half ago where uh, I was able to, to exploit a vulnerability in the body scanners where they can't see um, objects of certain densities on, on certain parts of the body. So in particular, uh, metallic objects uh, on the side of the body uh, cannot be detected. So I so, so think um, the ramifications of this are... Uh, anything encased in metal placed on the side of the body can be taken through. Uh, a firearm that's all metallic simply strapped onto the side of the body with no other modifications uh, can be taken through. And you know, these were things that the TSA either knew or should have known during their testing. Uh, and these are things that the TSA and the public knew after I released it in March 2012. Um, they're still not fixed. Uh, these, these vulnerabilities where anyone can take a gun through TSA body scanners uh, are still in effect today. That's amazing. Now, one of the things that uh, most of the stuff that they redacted were your summaries of what you had seen in these documents. But you've got one quote at least in here that says, as of, and this is a direct quote from the TSA's document, as of mid-2011, terrorist threat groups present in the homeland are not known to be actively plotting against civil aviation targets or airports. Instead, their focus is on fundraising, recruiting, and propagandizing kind of sounds like our own government. Their focus is on fundraising, <laughs> recruiting, and propagandizing. But that's a direct quote from the TSA documents. Correct. And, and the, the big deal about this is that the TSA comes out in public, uh, and especially in front of Congress, and says, look, we need to, to molest the people. We need to take these body scans showing their nude body in order to let them through because otherwise the terrorists are going to blow planes out of the sky. Um, internally, they know that's not the case. Internally, they know that the threat from, from these kinds of, of, of terrorists and from non-metallic explosives and so forth uh, is minuscule. Um, they, they weren't able to find any evidence that anyone in the country was plotting any, any such attack. Um, so it, it is kind of, um, uh, kind of normal for our government now, uh, apparently, to, to exaggerate the threat um, beyond any kind of reality. We saw well, it with the NSA telling us that, um, you know, if, if we don't let them wiretap the entire country, that, uh, you know, they, there were 50-something right. plots that they were able to break up, and then it comes out that there maybe were one or two. Mm -hmm. uh, with the TSA, it's zero, absolutely zero terrorist attempts, absolutely zero evidence of any terrorist attacks uh, uh, being plotted, and this is the TSA's own analysis. And we've pointed out many times that they've got another agenda and we can see that agenda. I can see that agenda when I fly. I don't fly nearly as often as you do, but I see that the general public has been pacified. They'll just unquestioningly go through these uh, procedures no matter how absurd, no matter how ridiculous, no matter how ineffective they are, the public will go through them. I've seen people brag about the fact that they were excited and only took them X amount of time to get through. I don't see anybody other than myself when I'm flying. I'm usually the only one who opts out who challenges the system, who refuses to go through this, the rest of them are just blindly going along with this and happy if it happens very quickly, whatever they do to them. Yeah, well, the, the government has, has a lot of America scared. They come out and say that these terrorists exist in, in public and that, that we need to have these security measures. Um, it, it gets a lot of people to the point where they, they really uh, start to believe that the TSA is helping. Um, the, the comments on the Internet so far regarding this, this revelation that you guys posted yesterday uh, occasionally people um, comment things like, well, you know, there's no terrorist attacks. It must show that the TSA is working. Yeah, um, exactly. That, that kind of logic um, is, is, is uh, pretty, pretty crazy. It, it's the old bear repellent uh, logic. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm selling bear repellent. There are no bears. It must be working. Um, what, and, is, and what, so is working what is working is the control of the population. Just as I mentioned, they just passively go through it. You talk about the fact, well, hey, it looks like it's working. Earlier this week, I don't know if you saw the story or not, we broke the story in Houston Airport. They're threatening people, saying if you make any disparaging remarks to the agents or you make any jokes, you might be arrested. This is population control. This is training for the population. This is exactly what B.F. Skinner did 
when he would offer positive operant conditionings to his animals. Basically, you get to the airport, you want something really badly. You want to get on that plane. You're feeling pressure as far as time. You want to make sure you make your connection. And if you don't make any waves, you immediately get rewarded by them letting you get on a plane. It's exactly what B.F. Skinner did to his animals. It's just population control. Yeah, it, it does seem like an attempt at, at conditioning the American people to to be controlled, to be uh, comfortable with these these security procedures, and and, and even the the children that go through. Um, you know, there there are there are kids now that have not been alive before the TSA, um, that don't even know what it's like to to not have a government that uh, demands to to put their hands between their legs as a, a condition of flying. Absolutely. Now, in your lawsuit, you also cite some legal precedents. Uh, you refer to a case, U.S. versus uh, AUKAI, A-U-K-A-I. And you say that in that decision, searches may not be more extensive or intensive than necessary to further the purpose. And also, seizures must be evaluated against a reasonableness test that balances the threat against the efficacy and the intrusiveness of the search. That's in Illinois versus Lidster. Correct. So we've so, got some so clear Akai legal. stands for the prospect that um, the government is demanding to search us without probable cause, without a warrant, and and we call this, or they call this, an administrative search, um, and it's it's a narrow exception to the to the to the Fourth Amendment that the Supreme Court has carved out, um, but the exception is contingent on on the TSA searching only for things that constitute a, a direct threat to to aviation safety. Um, so if the TSA begins to, to search for drugs or to search for uh, child porn or to search for evidence of, of other kind of general criminality, um, they've broken that, that narrow exception and they're just conducting a warrantless search. Right. Um, this applies here because these, these full body scanners uh, are not calibrated to detect weapons or bombs. They're calibrated to show everything. Uh, and that's not a narrow search anymore. That's, that's a search to find anything that they can possibly find. Yeah, it's, it's a dragnet search. It's very much like what Snowden is complaining about. And it's, it's great that people are seeing that, but people have become pacified about the TSA when this is an actual physical search of your person, not just a looking into your computer. They're actually physically searching you, and we see all evidence that they're going to take this elsewhere because they are the Transportation Security Administration. It's not the Airport Security Administration. They're taking this already to the streets, they're looking to roll this out, and I'm sure that they're going to, if they don't stage a terrorist attack, they'll use a terrorist attack someplace to justify taking it to malls or to take it to streets. But I, I think going back to these legal issues, this shows the danger of our accepting the fact that the Supreme Court can carve out exceptions to the Fourth Amendment for people. Because once we take away the idea of reasonable searches, I believe that what the Fourth Amendment is saying is you can't do unreasonable searches, which means that you've got to have a reason for the search. They define in that second part of the Fourth Amendment, they say the reason for the search, you've got to go before a judge and you've got to be particular about what it is you're looking for, where you're going to look for it, who you're going to search. You've got to have a reason to conduct that search. And over and over again, we see that the mode of operand, uh, the, the way the, the government is operating is just to do these dragnet searches on everyone with a presumption that everyone is their slave or everyone is a guilty terrorist. Correct. We, we've definitely seen the slippery slope, not, not just predicted it, but uh, it's happening. Um, yes. these, these, these exceptions are, are carved out from the Fourth Amendment that uh, you know, kind of seem sort of reasonable at the time that they do it. Like uh, 30 years ago when uh, air piracy was, was a big deal, they said, all right, put some metal detectors in airports. Uh, and look at where that got us. That got us to, to literally have the government uh, touching us, to have them, have them putting in these, these high-tech uh, nude body scanners that don't actually work, but uh, are certainly quite invasive. Uh, and you know, the, on the other side with the, the NSA and um, essentially taking in everyone's data and saying, well, we're, we're, we're not going to look at it. We're just going to keep it around in a locked box. So that's, that's how we're getting around the Fourth Amendment. That's right. Um, this, this slippery slope uh, has to stop uh, or else it will end with no privacy at all. Well, thank you for your efforts. Tell us, we're about out of time. Tell us uh, what happens at this point with your lawsuit. Where do we go from here? So at this point, the government gets a chance to respond. Um, the, the U.S. attorney on the case is, is now unfurloughed, so uh, we can expect maybe a timely response. That's right. He's uh, been on vacation for two weeks. So. Yeah, yeah, a little bit of vacation in, in the U.S. attorney's office. 
uh, and uh, we'll we'll go from there. So this is the last challenge to the to the constitutionality of the body scanners and, and the pat downs. Um, the other ones have either been dropped or dismissed. Um, so this this is our last chance to have a court actually look at um, what the TSA is doing and, and tell us if it's constitutional or not. Wow, that's just amazing. Amazingly sad that this is our last uh, effort to do this. And amazing that people would stand for this. Like I said, it, this is worse than what's going on with the NSA because they're actually invading your body, not just your information, in my opinion. It, it's even worse. But thank you so much, John, for your efforts on this. We'll be following this very closely. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, that's an amazing story. I mentioned B.F. Skinner because his most important work is beyond freedom and dignity. If they can rob you of your dignity, it's very easy for them to rob you of your freedom. They're connected. You have dignity and freedom that is inherent as being a person, a human being. If you want to know more about your rights as well as those that are respected, not just your God-given rights, but the ones that the Constitution actually expressly recognizes that these people are violating, Go to the InfoWars store and pick up the Citizen Rule Book there. That's something you can keep on you. It's something you can pass around. You can inform others and yourself. As yeah, okay, we're back. We started into a commercial there. and uh, Anyway, the, so the TSA is ineffective and illegal, and we've known it was illegal for quite a while. Um, yeah, okay. We're, we're getting ready to play you another video here. This one is about the NSA. Now, you know, shades of uh, J. Edgar Hoover on steroids, okay? J. Edgar Hoover used to compile all that information and then use it to blackmail whoever he got it from. And, uh, you know, what an opportunity. The NSA blackmailing people? No, that wouldn't happen, would it? How about blackmailing the president? Well, we, we got a little clip about that. And this is Amy uh, Martin from Russia Today. So take me out and go ahead and play it. Secret spying program. The man who leaked the story, Edward Snowden, has been thrust into the spotlight. However, it's important to remember that this is far from the first time someone has come forward to expose the overreach of the NSA. Before Edward Snowden, it was Thomas Drake, former senior executive. And before him, it was Bill Binney, a former intelligence official. But before Binney, the very first person to claim the title of NSA whistleblower is a man you've probably heard the least about. His name is Russell Tice, and he served 20 years within various government intelligence agencies, including the NSA. 2005, Tice blew the whistle on the NSA engaging in unlawful and unconstitutional surveillance of American citizens. So here to tell us his story and why he thinks that Snowden's leaks are just barely scratching the surface. Russ Tice, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. What did you see that made you come out and blow the whistle initially? Well, the first thing I saw was I'm a satellite system specialist. So with the things that I was doing with satellites, I found out sort of inadvertently that uh, American citizens were being um, spied upon by our space capabilities. So that was my first uh, sort of heads up into what was going on. And I was just shocked because NSA was not supposed to do this. It was against regulation. It was against the law. It was against our Constitution. So it was sort of... Um, it was sort of a come to Jesus moment for me. <laughs> sort of a wake up call there. You've alleged that the NSA abuses go far beyond what people are even talking about right now. How far does it go, Russ? Well, it, it goes very far because initially what I saw was uh, they were targeting news organizations, they were char targeting, targeting U.S. companies that did international business, they were charging, uh, looking at financial institutions, but they were also going after. Um, the State Department and uh, Secretary of State Colin Powell at the time, and they were going after high-ranking military generals, and that was just with my space capabilities that I saw. Now later, when I got together with colleagues, and we started to put together the terrestrial side, that's the side that is being done with all those nodes all over the country with the fiber optics and that sort of thing, then we found out that it got much worse. Because, and this was just the phone that we were looking at, but it was also being done at the email level, but, but that wasn't the information I was getting. The information I was seeing were phone numbers that were being plugged into a system that was going after uh, 
people's phone uh, phone numbers and associated numbers and a lot of a lot of numbers I wasn't even sure but they went after they went after law firms and lawyers they went after um, more generals. Uh, General Petraeus was one of the guys. It seemed like right about that three-star level was they were going after admirals and generals. They went after the Supreme Court, of which I held uh, Judge Alito's paperwork in my hand, numbers associated with Judge Alito that someone had put into the system that NSA used to spy on Judge Alito. And let's just break this down a little bit because these are explosive allegations right now that I have not heard anyone talk about before, that there are actually orders that you personally saw in your hands to wiretap Judge Alito, high-ranking intelligence officers, David Petraeus, Barack Obama. Want to be Senator Barack Obama at that time? He wasn't even a senator. He he um, had won his primary in Illinois, and I think maybe the catalyst, and I don't, I'm not sure, was the fact that he had just done a big speech at the Democratic uh, convention. Now, now I, I was at that time a lifelong Republican. I didn't even watch the Democratic re convention. So, at the time, it you know. The significance of it really didn't hit me until later. I mean, I did look up, well, who's this guy, Barack Obama? Well, okay, he made a speech, blah, blah, blah. But then, of course, later, things you know, started to you know, come into play that this is our future president of the United States. And you've also said that this is not just in their congressional offices. I mean, we're talking about home surveillance and personal. Correct. This, is, this would be, for, for a senator or a congressman, it would be personal phone numbers associated. It would be, and, and a lot of the times I could not tell because there, there, a lot of the numbers were unlisted. And we would go to try to, to, to reverse, to find out where these numbers were. And we were being very careful about it because we didn't want too many people to figure out how we were doing that. But we would find that it would be associated with family members, especially wives or, or spouses, you know, the other direction. But it, it would be their, also, their, their district office, if it was a congressman for whatever state, they'd have two or three or four little district offices back home. So, so, so it would pervasive. be very, yes, it would be very um, I guess the next inclusive. question is, who is, it, who is administering the surveillance? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, it looked like... The, inf the, the plugging in of these phone numbers was being done in the evenings at NSA. So almost it was like being done on the sly, even so that most NSA employees did not know what was going on. Now, a high-level person at NSA told me this was being directed from the vice president office. That would be Vice President Dick Cheney. Now, I don't know that for sure, but that's what I was told from a very senior person at NSA. So a high-level Bush administration official. I guess the next question is, why? Why was it being done? I mean, I, the first thing that comes to my mind is blackmail. I don't know the answer to that either. Um, what do you think? I mean, based on your experience, Russ, Well. What, what could the reason be to be wiretapping and spying on people like Obama, Judge Alito, Petraeus? I think you hit the word. Uh, you know, to me, I don't know for sure, but that would be a means of control. If you were to look and, and be able to listen to everybody's conversation for years on end, for, for a period of time, you, you could probably find out perhaps some salacious information that could be used to control that individual. Now, you know, if, say, it's the intelligence community. I, I noticed that the intelligence community is not being hit with the sequester, the intelligence budget. Well, how is that possible? Um, is there some kind of leverage that's being placed on our three branches of government to make sure that the intelligence community is, is gets what they want? In other words, is the intelligence community run in this country, not not our government? Um, that's and I guess of, that begs the question: What is there some sort of shadow government at play? I mean, are we talking about the military-industrial complex here? What do you think, as an insider and through all your research and people that you've talked to, who's running the show here, Russ? Well, remember, I don't know for sure. I just know, I just know that a whole lot of people got wiretapped. But if I, if I had to guess, I would say it's the, it's the, the upper echelon of the intelligence, of the intelligence community that, that is running this show. And um, it makes me wonder, people like Dick Cheney, I mean, are they still working behind the scenes? We know that these people have been in, working behind the administration and, and behind the scenes for decades. I mean, Kissinger, all these people, they're kind of, who knows? I mean, do you think that they're still vetting people? like Obama, you know, to get in the positions that he's in. Um, but you know what? Political opponents have been spying on each other for decades. So how is this different now? 
but what, what's different about this is this, this is at the Orwellian scale. This is the, the everything scale. This isn't just Richard, Richard Nixon going after a few you know, enemies list. This is everybody and everything. And now NSA, <clears throat> excuse me, NSA is literally tapping every communication, every digital communication in this country, content, not just, not just the metadata, the content. And, w and when they're saying, well, it's not that far, once again, they are lying. They, are, they, they continue to lie about the full capability. Right. What's your response to Obama consistently saying, we're not doing that? <laughs> we, the previous president in, in April of, of uh, 2004, you know, condescendingly pointed at a camera and said, we, we only do such things with a court order. Now, now, I did not know at the time that the president was lying because I did not know how high up you know, that went. But now we know President Bush was lying you know, blatantly to right. the American people. So now, now President Obama is lying to the American people. Is it because he's being controlled? I don't know. But I certainly know when he was candidate Obama, even though I was a Republican and I heard that he wanted to stop these things and he was going to make sure that we didn't have national security letters just willy nilly and, and, right. and, and NSA, I, I was for Obama, even though I was a conservative. Um, I can't trust anything. I mean, all these political politicians just seem like actors. I mean, I call DC Hollywood for ugly people. It's as you can't ever tell what these people really think. But I wanted to go into the media because, really, why do you think the media is in a frenzy over Snowden's allegations? Really, you came out eight years ago and said almost the same thing, except on a smaller scale, Russ. And really, you've been censored. Tell us your story about trying to get this information out as well. Well, I mean, as I, I, I was trying to get the news out, and I was trying to, with, with Snowden coming out, I figured now was the time to try to right. tell the rest of the story. Because I've been holding on to this for a long time. And I, when I went on Keith Urban's show four and a half years ago, I decided I was going to tell the media that NSA was going after journalists and news organizations, and there seemed to be no interest whatsoever from the media that I was telling that NSA was going after you. So they either considered me a liar, or they considered me, you know, NSA's, you know, oh, this guy must be crazy, or there must be some other interest that was making sure the media was not covering this. Now, I don't know what that is, but I know that it was got, not getting much coverage. So I figured with the Snowden thing, and the difference with Snowden is he has tangible evidence. Mm -hmm. He has paper. Mm -hmm. Now, because he has paper and it has classifications, they are, they are after him because he has the tangible proof of what I've said in the past. It's easy to dismiss me when it's my words, and you just say, well, that guy's a lying or crazy liar. But now we have the proof that what I've said in the past is true. And they want Snowden bad because he's now codified the truth of what is going on with the National Security Agency. You've said that we are living in a police state right now. Why? Well, I, I sort of consider this sort of a, a, a light police state because they're, they're hiding the fact that it's a police state. I mean, the fact that they can literally go into all of our communications, all our digital communications, uh, the fact that you know, it's been disclosed recently that the, the post office is now doing a cover on every tangible letter that goes to the post office. They're taking a picture of everything. They're looking at the, the return address, and they're looking at the, the, the main address of who's mailing something. And, and that is also being digitally stored. So every means of communication in this country, everything is being watched by, by the federal government. And that is Orwellian, and that is a trademark of a police state. Thank you so much. We're going to have to wrap it up now. A lot more to be said. Russ, I'm glad you're in town. I'll have to get you on again soon. Russ Tice, original NSA whistleblower. Thank you. OK, well, it's <laughs> all right. Just laughing at my background. Anyway. Uh, NSA whistleblower, uh, people say, how come we don't hear from any whistleblowers? Well, it's probably because you haven't been listening or uh, you haven't been listening to the right places. They certainly didn't play that on mainstream uh, television. Now, um, while we're, before we move on, the, the NSA has uh, some information that's only local. Remember? Uh, Utah is the home of the new NSA data collection center with acres and acres of high-tech electronics. Well, uh, 
I have it on good authority, and it's also only in the local Utah media. It's nowhere else. You won't find it on any of the mainstream media other than in Utah. But the opening of the NSA site has been delayed an entire year because of power problems. They're, they're having problems blowing the grid or something every time they turn on their backup systems. I, I might have that wrong, but the, the overall story that I do have right is that they've delayed the grand opening because of that. So um, now I'm going to shift gears a little bit and go talking about the economy. And uh, years ago, uh, a man named John Perkins put out a book called The Economic Hitman. And uh, I've got that book, and it's, it's an interesting story about how, you know, he worked for things like the International Monetary Fund and other, you know, monetary groups like that. And, and he's, he explains how their purpose was to, you know, make loans to countries that they could never repay and then come in later and say, well, you can vote with us on this certain bill in, in, in the UN or you can give us access to your natural resources or whatever is compensation. And they, they use it to steal the national resources or, you know, illicit political power. So we're going to hear a clip here. This is Amy Martin again interviewing John Perkins, and we're talking about our present-day economy. percent of the world's population yet consume over 60 percent of its resources. The U.S. alone gobbles up a whopping 25 percent of the energy on Earth. Believe it or not, this shocking disparity is by design. At least that's what my next guest alleges. In describing how this system works, self-titled economic hitman John Perkins says that through the guise of foreign aid, the natural resources of the planet are seized and profits funneled into the pockets of a few. He's also the author of the best-selling book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, and Hoodwinked. He joins me now. John Perkins, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Abby. It's great to be with you again. John, you allege that you were an economic hitman, which you describe as a highly paid professional who cheats countries around the world out of billions of dollars. Are there any government documents that back up this decades-long global conspiracy? Oh, I think everything that's coming out uh, around the NSA, you know, Ed, Ed, Edward Snowden's revelations certainly back up an awful lot of it. We're going deeper and deeper into this, so I, I think at this point there's very little question. Plus, uh, we've admitted to overthrowing governments like Mossadegh in Iran. There's a recent book about uh, the Dulles brothers who were involved in that. We've admitted to overthrowing Arbenz in, in Guatemala. The CIA did that. Uh, and uh, in Chile, Allende. Henry Kissinger has admitted to it. It's, yes, there's a lot of documentation <laughs> that totally substantiates this. Uh, your book also claims that so-called jackals are the corporate murderers that have carried out assassinations on world leaders that don't comply with the program, such as the former president of Ecuador. If that's the case, John, why are you alive? Well, I get that question a lot, Abby, but, and the reason is, I, I actually, I started writing this book in the early 80s. My daughter had just been born. Uh, I contacted other people that had been in the business and received threatening phone calls, threatened my life, threatened my young daughter's life. I was also then offered a consulting job with Stone and Webster, a large uh, consulting firm out of Boston and New York. Uh, they said I had a great resume, which I did. I'd been chief economist at one of their rivals. And they'd like to use my resume and proposals. They'd like to pay me a very large consultant's fee, about a half a million dollars. Just don't write the book. And I wouldn't have to do any work. So here I am in this position where my life and my daughter's life is being threatened. I'm being offered essentially a bribe, but it's a legal bribe. There's nothing illegal about what they did. I took the money, and in my own defense, I have to say that I put it toward good things. I, I, I made trips to places, like, for, for countries that we were screwing in Latin America, wrote books like Shapeshifting, The World is As You Dream It. But I didn't expose what was going on. And then after 9-11, I decided I, I had to come clean. At this point, I decided to uh, write the entire manuscript without telling anybody I was writing it, and then get it out into the hands of major publishers. At that point, it became my best insurance policy. In fact, even today, you know, if, if someone were to shoot me when I walk out of the studio, um, the book would sell many, many millions more copies, and that's exactly the opposite of what the jackals would like to have happen. So whistleblowers should never threaten to blow the whistle. They should just get all their ducks in order and then blow the whistle. <laughs> exactly. Uh, there are some high-profile deaths of political leaders that have happened here in the U.S., John, that people still question to this day. Do you think that jackals operate inside of America, too? 
You know, I have no personal proof of that, but uh, it's sometimes hard to believe that, that, that they weren't involved in some of these things. It, it certainly uh, follows a model that I've seen in many other countries. As I mentioned in my books, I was personally involved with Jaime Roldos, the uh, democratically elected president of Ecuador, and Omar Torrijos of Panama, both of whom were assassinated. And some of the things we've seen in this country are uh, very, very akin to what I've seen overseas. As I said, I, I personally was never involved, don't have any personal evidence of that. Let's talk about Syria. Uh, clearly the goal was regime change, but it didn't happen. Should we expect Assad's plane to crash soon? I think he's pretty well protected. <laughs> you know, it, it's similar to Saddam Hussein, who certainly we tried to win him over using economic hitmen, as, as we had done in Saudi Arabia very successfully. But Saddam Hussein would not buy in. The jackals tried to take him out. They couldn't. He had very good security. So that's when we sent in the military. I suspect Assad's in a very similar position, that he's, it's, he's probably very well protected. And of course, the fact that, that Russia uh, is backing Assad in many respects uh, makes that very difficult, too. In a place like with Gaddafi in, in Libya, we have more international support than we do in Syria. Last time you were on the show, John, you were talking about when the evolution occurred of corporate, corporate control pretty much over governments. Uh, when and how did that transition take place? It, well, it really started at the end of World War II when the World Bank and the IMF were created at the Bretton Woods Conference. And these were institutions that were created to help uh, reconstruct a devastated Europe. And they did a pretty good job at it. But then very soon after that became this tension between the Soviet Union and the United States, what we know as the Cold War. And then the, these institutions became very supportive of big corporations because they wanted to prove that, that capitalism was better than the Soviet system. And so they really bought into the corporate policy, supported big corporations around the world, privatizing things in, in developing countries, making huge loans to developing countries that they couldn't pay off, so then demanding that, that they privatize their electric utilities, their water and sewage systems, sell them to our corporations. There was this huge expansion. There was this cozy relationship between these major banks, and then Wall Street got involved, and the corporations. And then, of course, there was detente. But it didn't stop there. The, the cozy relationship had developed, and it continued and continued to develop. So really, at this point in time, it's safe to say that the World Bank, uh, the International Monetary Fund, much of Wall Street serves essentially as a tool for big corporations. And, and in fact, so does the U.S. government, so does the Pentagon, so does the NSA, so does the CIA. Very, very much supportive of big corporations. You know, we've seen with these, these Snowden revelations about the NSA that a lot of their spying was done to help corporation, U.S. corporations gain an advantage over others, oil, oil companies and, and other corporations in different uh, countries. Right. Uh, and one thing that I thought was really fascinating is that you said that the NSA personally vetted you for your job at the strategic consulting firm decades ago. I mean, so obviously you were privy to the, pretty much the extent of this global spying apparatus far before the leaks came out. And, and Glenn Greenwald claims that the most damning revelations are yet to come. What else could be worse than we already know, John? Oh, well, I'm sure it can get an awful lot worse. You know, isn't it interesting how already, you know, the... Uh, Dilma Rousseff, the president of Brazil, has declined to come to the United States and meet with Obama because of spying in her country. And, and I think there's, there's a back story to that, too, that most of us haven't heard, and that is that the U U.S. supported a very brutal uh, military dictatorship in, in Brazil back when I was an economic hitman, and Dilma was a resistance fighter. And so she's very sensitive to the idea of the U.S. government spying on her or anybody in her government. We don't hear that very often. And three other major countries in Latin America have broken ties with European countries because of this thing over Snowden. So it's become huge. And I think we're going to, yeah, I think we're going to hear an awful lot more. And yes, I was interviewed by the NSA. I was offered a job at the NSA uh, back when I first got out of business school. Uh, they put me through lie detector tests, personality tests, and they determined that I would actually make a pretty good, good agent. <laughs> um, do you still have connections to the system? I mean, do you still have ties to any current economic hitman and have you tried to convince them that they're working for sociopathic plutocrats? <laughs> well, only through my books, Abby. I, I, I'm really very much out of the system. I mean, I do run into people from time to time. I go out and have dinner or beers or something with a, with a few guys who were doing this before or women. So th there are connections there, yes. But frankly, at this point in time, my main goal is to create a better world. 
uh, to, to expose what happened in the past and to use that as a springboard into moving a new, into a new type of economy, working with corporations to turn them around, to convince them that their main job is to serve a public interest. It's not just to make huge profits uh, for Wall Street and, and for the 1% the or the wealthy, but to actually serve a public interest. The U.S. has a big, a long history of having set that back in the 1800s as a prime goal of corporations. So I see my job today is turning what I would call a death economy, which we have today, one that's based on the military, it's based on ravaging the earth, tearing up resources. Let's turn that around and convince these corporations and pay our taxes to corporations that will, instead of making weapons, help clean up the terrible pollution of the planet, help starving people around the world grow food more efficiently, store it and distribute it more efficiently, create better systems of transportation, energy, marketing, banking, and so on and so forth. I think there's tremendous opportunities here uh, to create a, a, a really b much better wor e economic world, a, a life economy instead of a death economy. I absolutely agree with that. But John, if the third world is in perpetual indentured servitude to the first by design and the riches of the first world based on the debt of these countries, how can that ever change? We have about a minute left. Well, yeah. I think it's going to take a real change in consciousness and on our part, and that's why I write, that's why I'm on shows like this, that's why you're doing this show, thank God you are, that's why we're doing what we're doing, because we've got to get people to understand that the real solution to acts of terror around the world is to get rid of the causes of terror, terror the deep underlying causes, which are desperation, which are poverty, which are people's lands being taken away by oil companies and public utility companies and, and big multinational corporations. If we want a good world, a sustainable, just, and peaceful world, then we've got to create a new kind of economy around the world. And that is going to take all of us understanding better what's gone on, what we need to do to change it. It is a revolutionary values of consciousness, of just thought. Thank you for being such an integral part of that. John Perkins, author of Confe Confessions of an Economic Hitman, hoodwinked. Everyone check it out. Thanks so much for coming on. My pleasure, Abby. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. Uh, we're going to be opening up the phone lines in just a minute, so you can get ready to call in. Uh, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Didn't he get it exactly right with the, you know, what we should be doing with our economy? Uh, it's always bothered me that, you know, there's a very simple test. You can just, is the bill or law that was just passed, whose interest is it in? Is it, does it suit anybody you know? I mean, does it help anybody you know or ever heard of? Probably not. If not, then it, they're not working for you. You know, over and over again, they, they, they go for war and it only enriches the military industrial complex. It doesn't help anybody on the planet except those rich. I won't say it. We're supposed to be on, if, I, if we were on after 10, I could say whatever I want. But anyway, I like that, that key, that expression, sociopathic plutocrats. Just remember that, that's really true. Well, uh, the clip we're gonna play next is is one that will probably keep me from posting this on YouTube. We'll see. It might be a copyright violation, but it's gone viral. And you could argue that, that showing this clip is in the fair use. And I, I'll try that because I, I really think it is a fair use item. I don't show Dylan Radigan or N MSNBC clips on any basis at all. And this is uh, just because it's so exceptional. Um, you know, you wonder why a lot of people don't react with the common sense that we all should have, uh, or some of us actually do have. And uh, it's really refreshing once in a while to see somebody who does. So we're going to go ahead and play this. This is only about five, four and a half minutes, five minutes long. We owe seventy trillion dollars. Yeah, I understand that, but it goes to, to walk out a four trillion dollar solution, I, okay, which is basically just a way for the Democrats to avoid dealing with this until twenty seventeen. I'm not here to talk about plans to deal with this till twenty seventeen. I'm saying we've got a real problem, and I'm tired of Republicans and Democrats who either want Republicans who want to burn the place to the ground, and Democrats, with all due respect, who want to offer a plan that gets it through the ne their end of their second term of their presidency, and then screws me and my kids okay, when it's over, so and until that? we okay. do that we have to deal with the extraction that is at foot it is the reason the financial markets are behaving the way they're behaving that is a mathematical fact I, this is not some opinion this is a mathematical fact 
Tens of trillions of dollars are being extracted from the United States of America. Democrats aren't doing it. Republicans are not doing it. An entire integrated system, financial system, trading system, taxing system that was created by both parties over a period of two decades is at work on our entire country right now. And we're sitting here arguing about whether we should do the $4 trillion plan that kicks the can down the road for the president for 2017 or burn the place to the ground, both of which are reckless, irresponsible, and stupid. And the fact of the matter is, until we actually, and I don't, and I'm sorry to lose my no, temper, no, and get, no, but no. I tell you what, I've been coming on TV for three years doing this. And the fact of the matter is that the re, there's a refusal on both the Democratic and the Republican side of the aisle to acknowledge the mathematical problem, which is that a, the United States of America is being extracted. It's being extracted through banking, it's being extracted through trade, and it's being extracted through taxation. And there's not a single politician that has stepped forward Susan, to deal yeah, with this. But there's uh, only one right now. The, the leader of the wait, free world, whether you like it or not, the but, president of the United States is arguably one of the most powerful individuals we have out there. But and Susan, he's what you're president. saying is exactly the point that Dylan is making. It's no. not about one guy. It's about all no, of them. No, I actually disagree. To I, I think Dylan's saying it is, one guy is about her. one guy. It is what about one guy. What is he doing? What because would you like him to do? I would, like him, him, I would do. like him to go to the people of the United States of America and say, people of the United States of America, your Congress is bought. Your Congress is incapable of making legislation on health care, banking, trade, or taxes, because if they do it, they will lose their political funding, and they won't do it. But I'm the President of the United States, and I won't have a country that is run by a bot Congress. So I'm not going to work with a bot Congress and try to be Mr. Big Guy, I'm working with the bot Congress. I'm going to abandon the bot Congress, like Teddy Roosevelt did, and I'm going to go to the people of the United States, and I'm going to say, you've got a bot Congress. And until we get rid of the bot Congress, which is Jimmy Williams, constant point, which is get the money out of politics, and until a president says that's the problem and says he's going to fix it, there is no policy that I can possibly see, no matter how brilliant your idea may be, or your idea, or my idea, or her idea, or your idea at home, is... That idea will not happen as long as there is the capacity to basically fire a politician who disagrees with me by taking funding away from him. Is that a fair assessment? Money in politics is the root of all political evil. It is corruption at its worst. And until we step up and kick that out of the park, it's going to be the same system all and only. Okay, uh, I figured that we'd better give some time. We have about six minutes, so you can call in now and you'll get to voice your opinion about what you've just seen or maybe something you haven't seen yet. But... Uh, yeah, we have a bot Congress. Well, you know, we've known that for a long time. Uh, it's the money that that, they, that gets the best uh, return for its investment is, you know, by a congressman. It's a lot better than investing in technology or any other thing. Uh, yeah, you put a, put a few hundred thousand dollars into a congressman's uh, re-election campaign and and he'll still he'll steer a couple billion dollar project your way. It's just amazing. And again, you know, it's so obvious what they're doing if people would just stop. And I hear people arguing all the time about Democrat versus Republican, and they get so angry with each other because they each think they're right and the other guy's at fault, and they're both stupid. You understand what I'm saying? People who argue that way back and forth about Republican this or Democrat that are stupid. And I really mean that. I mean, they bought into the whole game. It's Democrat versus Republican. It's a false left-right paradigm. It's a false Democrat-Republican paradigm. It does not match reality. These guys are lockstep in promoting anything military, lockstep in promoting wars, lockstep in promoting shifts of, great shifts of your wealth to their pockets or the people that pay for them. And how long is it going to take before you stop playing that game of, you know, right now we've got Democrats in power, so the Republicans will save us. After the Republicans get in power, everybody will be crying for help, and the Democrats will save us. And then the Republicans, and then the Democrats, and then the Republicans, and all along the way, you're just going, meh, meh, I'm a sheep. 
I'm going to be a, a Republican sheep or a Democratic sheep. In other words, you don't want to have anything change. You want to play their game. You like it the way it is. You like the economy the way it is because you keep voting for Democrats. You like the economy the way it is because you keep voting for Republicans. You like the way it is. You like the injustice and the war because you keep voting for Democrats and Republicans. That's proof that you like it. Did you vote for Obama? Well, then you voted for the most warlike president we've ever had. And he got the Nobel Peace Prize. Ha! That's a slap in the face for any thinking civilization. My God. Well, you got three minutes if you want to call in. We, it's 288-4448. We still have a chance for you to call up and, and agree or disagree with what I have to say. Our next show is the uh, first Saturday in November, okay? And, of course, that's coinciding, basically, uh, the month that 50 years ago, John F. Kennedy was assassinated by the CIA and others. So, you know, who says we don't have coup d'etats in this country? We have them all the time. Roughly every 20 years there's a coup d'etat. It's just that whoever wins gets to write the history. All right, we've got a phone call. Ah, they, they didn't stick around long enough. Okay, well, try again. It, might, it could be a technical error. Sometimes our new phone system hangs up instead of selects you. But uh, anyway, it, it'll be interesting to see what you think. Now, I've, I've gone over the TSA, which is trying to pretend to protect your security on airlines and they're branching off to protecting you at proms you know high school proms are going to be protected by the TSA for God's sake oh and and the facts come out that they haven't protected anybody yet they haven't caught anybody they haven't prevented anything yet and all they're doing is what they call security theater then we have the NSA spying on everybody and they don't care that you know now and Alex Jones isn't a conspiracy nut anymore. He's a historian, okay? So you can't call him tinfoil hat wearers anymore. Er, uh, Edward Snowden brought out the documents that prove what people like Alex Jones and myself have been saying for years. Okay, we got the phone call again. Let's try it. We got a minute and a half or less. Hello? Hey, Bill? Yes, go ahead. I hear you. Okay, yeah, I just uh, was wanting to know what your thoughts were on Building Set. I mean, Building Six. Oh that yeah, big I've gigantic heard... hole in the center, no no debris inside. Well, see, that is what you call a uh, let's see a, a subjective interpretation of selective observations, and it's not a fact that that center hole is just completely missing. But people like Judy Woods have run with it and use it as their center keystroke or their center uh, point to prove that there was some sort of destructive weapon way beyond our knowledge and you know and then she tries That's to downplay hole in there, though. what's that? There's a gigantic hole in one yeah, they show sure from the is. inside. There's no debris. I believe that it's actually been covered. People have already answered that question and it always bothers me that the Judy Woods supporters keep bringing back the same stuff that's already been thoroughly disproved. You know, she's a scam. Judy Woods is a scam. She's about the farthest I'm not thing from a scientist that you can possibly about have. The hole. Well, anyway, and no debris. We got six seconds, so we'll be live again in November. Okay.